Okay, so good morning, everyone. I think this is class six of Hashem Safasai Tiftah, which is the mimer, the first mimer in the book called To Pray as God Would Pray. Or if you're just following the link, then it's on the link. We said that today we would review, God willing, the first um the first mimer or the first section of the of the first mimer because it was quite elaborate and detailed and that we thought maybe it would be helpful to review before we continue on so was, uh, this is a summary um that i put together but then also i thought maybe we'll just reread it if there's time you know do the summary and then reread it maybe even without the footnotes but just as like to reread it as a review also um and hopefully the second time around, it's going to, it'll sound a little bit more familiar, you know, and, and it'll be a little more clear. How so could I just, print it? Well, you can't okay. right now because it's not, I, I okay. haven't, haven't emailed it out yet, but I can, I can email it out after, uh, after class. Right I'm old. I do better with printed. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so this is Hashem Sefasai Tiftah from 5712, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. This is the Mimer, the name of the Mimer. And we just did section one, but this is kind of a review of section one. So the Pasuk that the Mimer is based on is May Hashem open my lips and my mouth will recite your praises. This is the, should hopefully sound familiar. It's the passage that we say before we begin the Amida, before we begin the Shemona Esrei. So the background idea is that David HaMelech says this, this, is, this passage, this verse, is from Tehillim, uh, from Psalms. So David HaMelech says this and represents the entire congregation of Israel in this prayer, um, and also represents each individual Jew when he says this prayer. He does this because he's the king of the nation, and so the king represents the Jewish people and their needs and, and tries to provide for them in the physical realm, you know, beseeching God on their behalf. And mystically, they also both represent the sphere of Malchus. Both the king and the Jewish people represent the sphere of Malchus. Um, and so he sort of is a spokesperson for the entire nation as the king. The sages ordain that we all say this before we start the Shema Nesrei prayer. This verse that David Hamel says we, the sages ordained that we should say it before we start the Shemona Esrei prayer, which will be abbreviated SE from here on in, in the document. So our question is, um, it's one question, but it has three levels of, of depth to it. Level one, why did the sages ordain that it be said at the beginning of the Shemona Esrei prayer? Why not at the beginning of the prayer service? Meaning, it's a great line, it's a great prayer, it's a, a great request of God, right? May Hashem open my lips and my mouth will recite your praises. The davening is about praising Hashem, one of the points of davening. So, like, why don't we just say it right before we begin the formal prayers? Level two of the question is, in the Talmud, it explains that Rebunah linked Geula, which is defined as the last bracha before the Shemun Esri prayer, which is ends with the words Ga Al Yisrael, which means who redeemed Israel. So that's called Geula, the redemption, to prayer. And prayer is the Shemun Esri, the, the, uh, the definition of prayer in, in the Talmud. Like when it says, when it talks about prayer in the Talmud, it's actually referring to the Shemun Esri, the Amida prayer itself. So in the Talmud, it says that Rabuna linked Geula to Tefillah, which means he linked the Baruch of Ga Al Yisrael, which is at the end of Shema, to Shema Nesrei, and that that is considered to be a good practice. So if that's considered to be a good practice, why would the sages insert a Pasuk in between the Baruch of Ga Al Yisrael and the beginning of Shema Nesrei? Um, and even if the fact that they place it there means it is okay to do so, which is what the answer is, like they place it there and we're supposed to link the two, but if they place that Pusuk there, it means that that's not, it's not actually making a, a separation between the two. It's for, somehow or other, it's fine. Um, even, if, even if that's the case, why would they place it there 
when we should be connecting Geula to Tefillah. Meaning, even if we say sort of in a backhanded way, well, the fact that they put it there means that it's okay to put it there, but why put it there to begin with? Just put it somewhere else and we don't have a question. We don't have to have the answer. We can just have smooth sailing. That's level two of the question. Level three of the question is, well, yes, the whole concept of putting the two together and of being a good idea that it's talked about in the Talmud, there's a spiritual benefit to linking Geula to Tefillah. Also, it's not just like a good idea. There's like a spirit, there's something going on in spiritual realms mystically. So why tamper with that? Why tamper with this thing that's happening in the mystical realms? Um, that's the implied question, right? But there's something spiritual happening in when we're linking Geula to Tefillah as explained below. So the, the Myra goes into discussing what happens on a mystical realm when we link a Geula to Tefillah. So we have here Geula. Um, I can actually make this a little easier probably to read. We have here Geula and Tefillah. And this is just, it's, I put it into a chart form. Obviously, it, you know, this is not the order that the Mimer discussed it in. Um, but the concept of linking Geula to Tefillah is the concept of the bracha of Ga'a Yisrael to Shmona Esrei, right? That's what this concept of linking Geula to Tefillah refers to. What does it refer to in sort of the realm of our patriarchs and then in the realm of the mystical spheres? So Geula is connected to the idea of Yosef, to the personhood of Yosef, right? We know that each of the patriarchs is connected to a different midah and of the Shvatim, Yosef and Yehuda are also connected to a certain, um, a certain one of the spheres because they really carried on the legacy of the Avos. So Yosef is linked to Yisait and Yehuda and King David, as we mentioned before, but Yehuda sort of is the, is the descendant or the, is the, ancestor of the King David, um, Yehuda is linked to Malchus, right? Kingship comes from Yehuda in the form of King David, in the form eventually of the whole Davidic dynasty, which is, will culminate with the coming of Mashiach, or we'll see again in the, with the coming of Mashiach. Yosef is linked to Yisod, and Yehuda is linked to Malchus. Um, and we see that Yosef was linked to this idea of Geula, because as long as Yosef was alive, the Jewish people were not enslaved, right, in Egypt. They were down in Egypt, but they were treated like royalty for the time that you, Yosef was alive. Once Yosef passed away, um, the beginning of slavery started. So how do we see that Yosef is linked to the idea of Yosef, which is ultimately linked to the idea of, of redemption? And how do we see that Yehuda is linked to the idea of Malchus? which um, is, I should have put here, which is ultimately linked to the, the idea of prayer, which is this concept of well, that we're trying to say, right? So um, when Yehuda was born, he was, the verse that discusses his birth was, this time I will praise Hashem. That's what Leah said when, when she, he, she gave birth to him. So that's the concept of prayer. And Yosef, what does it talk about with Yosef? It says Yosef was the provider of grain for the entire land in Egypt, right? That was based on the dreams of Pharaoh that he interpreted. And he realized that there were seven years of plenty going to come and then seven years of famine. And so he took from the years of plenty and to provide for the Jewish people, even in the years of famine. And so he was the provider of grain for the entire land. Um, and so he... Um, and and his uh, nature was that as long as he, since he was above slavery, in his essence, he the Jewish people were not enslaved during his lifetime. So how is that connected to the concept of Yisoid and Malchus? Um, is that sort of mystically speaking, Yisoid, which is represented by Yosef providing grain, right? This idea of Yosef providing grain. Yisoid conveys the light of the higher spheres into Malchus. That's what Yisoid's, I guess you could say one of their, it's jobs, right? It, it connects. Yisoid means foundation. Foundations connect things that are above the ground to things that are below the ground, it, it, or to the ground, I should say. Things that are above ground to the ground. It's a connector, like the foundation of the house. 
So Yisoyed connects basically the lights of the higher spheres to Malchus, which Malchus, by the way, is compared to the ground in other uh, sources. So that is actually something uh, significant here. But so you said it conveys the light of the higher spheres into Malchus. And therefore, it's because of that, it's because of that energy of Yisoyed and that godly light that that Yisoyed funnels into Malchus, that the ability of Malchus to ascend with the sparks, that it is going down into the, the three worlds of Bria Tanasia to collect. The ability of Malchus to ascend with those sparks comes from the influence of Yisai that shines into Malchus. So Yisai not only gives from the higher realms into Malchus when everything is fine and dandy, you know, in the years of plenty and so on, um, but Yisai also gives to Malchus in the years of famine, in when Malchus descends the, into the three worlds of Briyat, Sianasiya, when Malchus descends to collect the sparks, it's through the energy of, of Yisoyed, funneling the energy of everything above it into Malchus that it's able to elevate those sparks and come back to its source, um, which is down here now, right, with the idea of Malchus, it's the external dimension of Malchus of Atzilos, the lowest level of the spheros of the highest world, which descends into the worlds of Briyat, Sianasiya, the three lower worlds, to get sustenance for her household by elevating the fallen sparks of godliness. This is what Malchus does, and this is how Malchus does it, right? This is the inner, this is the fuel that fuels Malchus to be able to do this. And therefore, we can understand, basically, that the linking of Yesod and Malchus is extremely important in the entirety of creation. Like, it's not a small thing. The whole fabric of creation is built around the fact that Yisoyed and Malchus are connected to each other, which basically refers to, and when we're in our context of what we're talking about now, the davening is the linking of Yisoyed and Malchus is the spiritual counterpart of linking Geula, which is the bracha of Ga Yisrael, to Tefillah, which is Shman Esrei. So the entirety of creation depends on this connection why would we put a puzzle in between them? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> right? Like, there's a huge thing going on here in the spiritual realms. The whole Seder Hishtoshlis, the whole order of creation is dependent on this link. And it feels like we're messing it up by putting this puzzle there. So why would we put the puzzle there? Um, another thought that is elaborated on here, right? Linking Geula to prayer, which again is that last Baruch of God, Yisrael to Shemona Esrei, um, is connected with Shemona Esrei, with the whole concept of Shemona Esrei, uh, because, since it represents the connection between the six lower Midas called Zer Anpin and Malchus called Nukva, right? Which is this idea of Yisrael and Malchus again. These are the fat masculine and feminine aspects of the Midas, Zer Anpin and Nukva. Zer Anpin, the six lower Midas, which ultimately are funneled into Yisoyed, from Yisoyed into Malchus, right? Uh, the six Midas being masculine, Malchus being feminine. Zer Anpin, the small visage, and Nukva meaning the, means feminine. That's what it means, the feminine dimension. So these are the masculine and feminine aspects of midai, of the Midas, of the seven Midas, right? You have the fat masculine being funneled into the feminine. Um, and this results from a new energy of Hashem being drawn down so they can be united. There needs to be something higher than both of them to unite them so that they can become united and can become one. That's the same thing that happens when we say Shema. Shema is associated with the connection of Chachma and Bina, which is the intellect. This is the masculine and feminine aspects of the intellect. This also results from a new energy of Hashem being drawn down so they can be united. So the masculine and feminine aspects of the intellect and the masculine and feminine aspects of the midas are being united, both because there's a new energy of Hashem being drawn down, and then we're linking Gal Yisrael to the Amida, right? We're putting it all together into one big process by doing this. How do we get the new energy of, of Hashem being drawn down so they can be united? How does that happen? This new energy can be drawn down through Bittal, self-transcendence. 
reciting the Shema with the arousal of love of Hashem to the point of Mr. Snafish accomplishes this. That's what, that's what, that's how we do it. But we say what we say Shema, we transcend our limited physical experience. We sort of give ourselves over to Hashem. We say that he's the only true existence. That new light that's brought down enables the Chaf Bambina to be united, the masculine feminine aspects of the intellect to be united. That goes then goes through to the Midas, and then we're able to also, um, that new light enables the masculine and feminine aspects of the Midas to be united, and that results in the connection between Ka'ula and Tefillah. So why would the sages ordain the saying of this Pasuk between Ka'ula and Tefillah? And the fact that they do it makes it necessary to explain that the verse is in addition to Shema Esrei. It's not it's not a hefsek. It's not actually something that's uh, breaking it apart. It actually adds. Why not just put the pasuk at the beginning of davening? Our original question is is you know strengthened. This is this is what's happening, right? This whole thing is happening, and of course, and as we mentioned at the time, this is all right. It's a parable. It's a parable in the physical world. Is the uniting of the male and the female, the birth of a child, right? Like that's the whole birth process on a very physical level. It's the birth process of an idea. It's the birth process of a plan. It's there's oh, all of this, the entire world is dependent on this. Why would we put this pasuk in between? But, uh, and we, and the answer is it's not in between. It's added to Shemona Esra. It's not actually br breaking it up. It's not actually separating it. But why would we put it there necessitating the question, necessitating the answer. Just put it in the beginning of davening. Another idea that's brought, which is actually brought before the end of that first ice, right? But another idea that's brought, which which I we learned at the end, and I'm explaining again at the end, not to break up the flow of the question, is why would we say Shema sitting when it's a higher level of the spheres that we are unifying, Chachman Bina, and sitting is connected to the lower worlds. <laughs> um, and say Shema Nasrei standing, when it's a lower level of series, we are unifying the Midas, and it and standing is connected to Atsilas, the higher levels. So what it doesn't seem to match. The higher is matched with the lower, then the lower is matched with the higher. It, do, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to match. The basic answer is that the higher levels of Khafman Bina, can, which are in Atsilas, can only be unified with some sort of revelation in the lower worlds. Hence we sit, because we're actually experiencing it in the lower worlds. The level of the levels of Shmona Esrei, the levels that we are uniting in Shmona Esrei, since they are low, that well, I should say that we are uniting in Shmona Esrei, uh, since they are lower levels, they're the they're the Midas, right? Um, they can they can be unified and experienced even in the higher realm. Hence, we stand. So we're like standing in Atsilas, low uh, unifying the lower levels, and we're sitting in Bria Sianasia, uh unifying the higher levels, but in the lower world. The union of Chafman Bina, the source of redemption, makes it pot makes it possible the union of Zer Anpin and Nukva, Tfila, and the ascent of Malchus. That's why we say Shema before we say Shmona Esrei. Like we've got to say Shema first, and then we can say Shmona Esrei. We, we're, we're accomplishing in Shema enables us to accomplish, you know, or say or daven shman esrei. Okay, that was a review of section one of the Mimer. Um, th this is the hardest section of the Mimer. It's definitely the hardest section of the Mimer. But that was a review of the first section. I mean, what it took us five weeks to just do the first section, right? So hopefully that sounded a little familiar to everybody who's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, and hopefully that was a helpful review. Um, I'm again. I was thinking that the second. Ha I mean, that what we could do now is just reread the whole first section of the Mimer. If people want to just reread it now that we've learned it through and we reviewed it, just to reread it, even without the footnotes, but just to reread it, that we can. It will sound, I think, familiar, and you know, the second time around, it will it will sink in a little bit more. It will get easier from here. This one will get easier from here. But this is this first step is definitely um, definitely much more complex. Okay, before we go inside, so does anybody have a question they want to ask um, before we go before we go inside?
I, I'm so glad you did the chart, Chaya, because I was thinking of doing one of my by myself. And I was thinking about it. I was saying, why didn't Chaya make a chart of this? Because this this is a, this is something that was, and you did. You made the chart. I'm so that's really helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Hi, Rita. I have a question. Hi, I have a question. Um, um, it's just it's connected and not connected. When I said, let's say Shema in, in the house and I prayed, and then I go to Shul, and they saying Shema, so I have to say Shema with them, right? Will you say the first pasuk of Shema if you're in a Shul and they're saying Shema? Just the just the first uh, chapter, yeah. The first pasuk. Ba'afta, and that's it, yeah. Shema, and that's it. The first pasuk. And that's it. I don't have to say everything. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank okay. you. Sure. Any other questions? <laughs> okay. I mean, it's complicated, and so I'm just I'm gonna pray for understanding. Is what I'm gonna dive in for. <laughs> More it is, safe. It is complicated. No problem. Um, I don't even want to pronounce the other thing that goes with Nukva. Zair. Zair Anfin. Zair Anfin. Where, do, where are those words coming from? Like, where, what do they go with? Atsilas and like, because there are all these different types it's of... It's the terminology of of, uh, of Kabbalah and Chassidus. Okay. That's what it is. Chaya. <laughs> Yeah. Could you go back to the Shema for a second? So if I on Shabbos did Shema at home before going to shul, I only have to say the first Pasuk when I go, when I'm with the minion? I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking. Whenever a person, whenever a person is in um, shul, mm -hmm. um, Whenever a person is in shul and they say and they're saying Shema, mm -hmm. we are not, we are we have to say Shema as well. We can't. Whenever the a, a congregation is pronouncing Shema, mm -hmm. we're not allowed to ignore it. We have to, because it look you know we can't it can't look like we are not agreeing with that with their pronunciation their proclamation that Hashem is one. So whenever a person is in shul, whether they davened or not is completely irrelevant. Um, but whenever a person is in shul and the congregation is saying Shema, they have to cover their eyes and say the first verse of Shema so that they've included themselves in the process of accepting the yoke of heaven. There's nothing to do with whether a person's davened or not. If they, if they didn't say Shema yet, they still say the first verse. If they did say Shema yet, they say the first verse. If, uh, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. If the congregation is saying Shema, then the person says the first, the first, the covers their eyes and says the first verse. If they're at a point in their own davening when they can speak. If they're at a point in davening that they can't speak, they just close their eyes and like hum the tune of Shema so it looks like they're also accepting the yoke of heaven at the same time that the congregation is accepting the yoke of heaven. But if they're at a point where they can't say the words in their own davening, then they don't say the words. But, but I don't have to do the rest because I've already have, done it. You have to do the rest for your own saying of Shema. But no, I'm saying, but I already did the Shema, so I don't have to do it again on Shabbos and Shul. It doesn't have anything to do with Shabbos. It has to, but you don't have to do it again. Well, it's nothing. Whatever. Nothing whenever to do with Shabbos sure. weekday. It has nothing to do with whether you did or didn't say Shema yet. If a person walks into a a, a congregation where they are saying Shema, if they're at a point in where they can speak, they have to they have to cover their eyes and say the first verse of Shema so that they've included themselves in the acceptance of the yoke of heaven. If and then a point, should I say the rest again if I've already said it? The first verse only. Yes, that's what my question was. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 the first verse. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so... Just trying to pull up the link here. Um, I don't know. People should also have it printed out or the book. But if not, here's the link.
Okay. Ready? Okay, let's see if we can just review, read it and review. Um, okay, you can see it? Okay. Okay, so section one. May Hashem, this is my, this is, this is the Pasuk, right? My Hashem, open my lips and my mouth will recite your praise. This Maya was delivered on Yon Aleph. Nissan. Okay, they put oh this is the okay, this is the issue. They put the first footnote into the text of the Maimon, and that's why all the footnotes are off after that. Um the Verbus 50th birthday, the day when he began reciting Capital Nun Aleph. That this this verse is from that capital. Um in, in Igor's Kaidish volume 9, page 238, the Rebbe writes that this Maimon is based on the on my marm of the Rebbe Maharash, published in Safer My Marm. 5726 and Sefer Memorandum 5627. See also Sefer Memorandum 5658, where these concepts are also discussed. This verse expresses the request made by King David, which is a request on behalf of Knesset Yisrael, right? Because it, we talk about how they are both the sphere of Malchus, the congregation of Israel, the spiritual source of the soul, souls of the Jewish people. This is also the request every Jew makes of God as he prays, right? We say this before we say, before we dive in Shemona Esrei. Um, thus, our sages ordain that it be recited before the Shemona Esrei prayer, as the Talmud states, Rabbi Yochanan says, at the outset, which means immediately prior to the Shemona Esrei, one should say, may God open my lips. This is the verse. This is the custom of what we do with the verse and when we say it. Explanation, however, is required. Why did our sages ordain that the verse be recited immediately before the Shemona Esrei prayers? Seemingly, they should have ordained that it be recited before one begins the entire sequence of prayer, meaning before Shema, before the blessings of Shema, even before Pesuket de Zimra. Right? We talked about the different stages of davening. Do it at the very beginning. Why was the custom instituted to recite the verse specifically before the Shemona Esrei? Look, we're asking Hashem to open our mouth, open our lips, and our mouth is going to recite His praises. Why not say it at the very beginning of davening? Before we do any davening, we're asking Hashem to help us recite His praises. Like that would be the seems to be the appropriate time. So that's like the level one of the question in the handout, right? The question is even stronger. Level two, the Talmud states, Reb Bruna once linked Geula to prayer. He wants the Geula to prayer, which is the Shemona Esrei. And a smile did not depart from his lips the entire day. It then questions this practice. How could the two be considered as being joined? For Rabbi Yochanan said, at the outset, one should say, my God, open my lips. Seemingly, the verse, my God, open my lips, intervenes between the blessing God Yisrael and the Shemona Esrei. Meaning, why would Rabbi Bruna say that he linked Gai Yisrael to Shman Esrei if we say this, this verse in between. So that, I, I think I'm, I think I mis-explained it, but he's, he, or it wasn't clear how I explained it. He's, he could calling it that he linked to Gula the Tefillah, even though the verse is in between. In resolution, the Talmud explains that since our sages ordained that a person recite this verse before the Shman Esrei, it's considered as an extension of Shman Esrei. So this is the answer to the question, meaning we, we he still linked to Geula the Tetfila because the sages are the ones who said to put the verse there and therefore it's not considered to be any kind of separation. But this intensifies the question. Since linking Geula to prayer is such a lofty matter, why did the sages institute the recitation of the verse, God opened my lips, precisely before the Shemona Esrei, thus raising a question about it being an interruption between Geula and prayer and requiring a resolution? In other words, it, it's called, Rav Runa said he linked Geula to Tefillah, and then we have a question, but he didn't really link Geula to Tefillah because there's this verse that's there in between. And then the answer to that is, well, the verse was put there by the sages, and therefore it's not an interruption. If it's not an interruption, um, so he linked it, so it's a good, and we want to all link it too. We're going to, right? That's our goal. We, we're going to see later. So 
but that makes that still we still have the same question why would they put the verse there necessitating the question necessitating the answer seemingly they should have ordained that it be recited before beginning the entire sequence of prayer in this way Gaula would have been linked to prayer in a manner that does not raise any questions again it's the same question level two like we still have the same question why would they put it there even if we say that putting it there does not constitute a separation don't put it there. Then we won't have a question. We won't have to have an answer. Just put it at the beginning of davening. The question is, is further strengthened when one considers the spiritual implications of linking Geula to prayer, right? It's not just that there's a physical thing that we insert this pasuk and that there's an, a question, why is it still considered to be a connection? And it is because the sages are the ones who ordained it. There's a mystical spiritual thing happening that we want to link these two things. It's explained in the text of Kabbalah and Chassidus that the link between Geul and prayer represents the union of Yosef and Yehuda. Yehuda is identified with prayer as reflected by the statement, this time I will thankfully acknowledge God, which is the statement his mother said when he was born. Right? So Yehuda is identified with prayer because she's thankfully acknowledging Hashem. That's a prayer. On a mystical plane, prayers identify with the sphere of Malchus. In the, it is the sphere of Malchus of Atzilus that descends to the worlds of Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya, as indicated by the verse, she provides food for her household. This descent is for the purpose of carrying out the task of refinement. Right, that phrase is what took us probably two weeks by itself, right? That this, this, this idea that uh, Yehuda is linked to, da, to a davening, Davening is linked to the sphere of Malchus. And what we know about the sphere of Malchus, of Atzilus, is that it descends into the lower realms and gathers the sparks and elevates them. Yosef is identified with the redemption, Gula, and salvation. Why? Because the potential for redemption. What's the, what is redemption? That Malchus ascend to its source in Atzilus with the products of its efforts of refinement, right? We just said that Malchus of Atzilus goes into the three lower worlds and elevates the sparks. So the that is, that's redemption. It's, she's redeeming the sparks. So what is it? What is it? How can that happen? How, how does she get the, the wherewithal to do that? It's because it's generated by a ray from the attribute of Yesoid, which is identified with Yosef. That's how she gets that um, energy. Those are That's like her food for her to go and be able to go into the three lower realms and elevate the sparks. So Yisaid provides influence for Malchus. That's what we're saying, basically. As is reflected by the verse, Yosef, who's identified with Yisaid, was the provider of grain for the entire land. Right, Yosef is providing grain, providing energy for the entire land. Malchus is actually compared to land, which the Rebbe doesn't say here, but we know that from another, other sources in Chasidus. So Yosef was the provider for grain for the entire land. Yosef provides influence to Malchus, even while Malchus is in a state of descent within the worlds of Bria, and Asiya. In other words, Yosef provides influence to Malchus when it's in Atzilus, and it provides influence to Malchus even when it's going into the lower realms. The parallel to the spiritual concepts described above was reflected in Yosef's conduct. He prepared the grain in the years of plenty so that there would be a reservoir supply, a reserve supply for the years of famine. Thus, he also provided sustenance in the years of famine. So Yosef provided sustenance in the years of plenty and in the years of famine. This is like Yosef, which provides Malchus with sustenance when it's in Atzilus and also when it goes into the three lower realms to gather the sparks. And because it provides sustenance to Malchus when it goes into the three lower realms to, to gather the sparks, and then it comes back up, Yosef is associated with the idea of redemption because he allows redemption to happen. This ray of attribute of, uh, of the attribute of Yisoyed, which is, a, which is identified with Yosef, makes it possible for Malchus to ascend even after it's descent into the worlds of Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya. That's what we just said, right? That's redemption. The, this, the joining of Yisoyed and Malchus, is the spiritual counterpart of linking Geula to prayer. We're joining the mystical realms of Yisoyed and Malchus, and in the physical realm of Widava, we're joining Geula to prayer. We're joining the bracha Ga'a Yisrael, 
to the Shemona Esrei. Geula to prayer is the brach of God Yisrael to Shemona Esrei, which is joining Yisrael to Malchus. On this basis, whoops, sorry, ladies. On this basis, we can understand why the concept of linking Geula to prayer is associated with the Shemona Esrei prayer. For the distinguishing characteristic of Shemona Esrei, in contrast to the previous elements of the prayer service, is the union of Zer Anpin and Nukva. All right, these are those Kabbalistic terminology. This is a this is in the in the in the the, the Kabbalistic jargon. Um, Kabbal Kabbalistic terminology is usually in Aramaic, and it's usually biological in its nature. And Hasidic terminology is usually in Hebrew, and it's usually psychological in its nature. That's sort of how you can tell the difference. So the, then they refer to the same parts, the same structure of creation, but they refer to different, slightly different concepts within. They're, they're highlighting different ideas a little bit. Or there's a different, like, purpose of Kabbalah and Hasidus. It's, so it's the same terminology. It's a different terminology for the same things, and it's a little bit of a different purpose in what they're talking about. So Zer Anpin are the six lower are the six Midais and Nukva is Malchus. In the terminology of Hasidus, it would be we would be calling that the six Midais and Malchus. The six Midas are masculine, Malchus is feminine. So that's why Zer Anpin and Nukva, the small visage, small face, and the feminine. So um Shmon Esrei is the union between Zer Ampen and Nukva. The Midas, the, the connection between the masculine and feminine aspects of the Midas. As explained in other sources, the recitation of the Shema is identified with the union of the sublime father and the sublime mother, which would be Abba and Ima, which in uh, Kabbalistic terms, I don't know why they decided to translate it into English here instead of using Kabbalistic terms, um, which is Chachman Bina Vatzilas, that's the Hasidic terms. While the Shmona Esther is identified with the union of Zer Anpin and Nukva. So, once again, when we say Shma, we're unify, unifying the Chachman Bina, Abba and Ima. Um, Abba and Ima, really. And then, the, and then in Shmona Esther, we are unifying Zer Anpin and Nukva. On this basis, the difficulty arises, not just the difficulty of understanding these things. <laughs> other difficulties a difficulty arises the Shema which is identified with oh this is this is the part that I like put into parentheses last time uh, um, but a difficulty arises the Shema which is identified with a higher rung within Atzilos right because it's the intellect it's Abba and Ema it's it's Chafma and Bina which is the is the intellect which is the higher the highest two spheres the, so the Shema, which is identified with a higher rung within Atzilus, is recited while sitting. So sitting, as explained, with regard to Moshe Vosechem, your sitting places, is associated with the worlds of Bria, Tzia, and Asiya. It's a lower level. You're sitting. When you sit down, you lower yourself. So sitting is the idea of lowering. Prayer, the Shema Esrei, which is identified with a lower rung within Atzilus, right? It's Zer Anpin and Nukva, the Midas, which is the lower half of the of the Mida, of the Sviris by contrast, is recited while standing. Standing is absolute self-nullification. You stand in front of, a servant stands before his master. He can't sit. It's not considered to be respectful to sit in front of one's master. You have to stand before your master in complete readiness to do whatever he wants you to do. That's an act that reflects utter bittal and is thus associated with the world of Atzilus because as we mentioned before, in the world of Atzilus, nothing feels itself to be its own identity. It only feels itself to be subsumed within godliness. And, uh, and and in the lower worlds, as we start to go down to the lower worlds, things start to feel themselves to be in existence a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. So therefore, um, why would we be sitting when we say Shema and standing when we say the Amida? It would seem like the higher level we should be standing for, the lower level we should be sitting for. But this, the paradox, however, is self-explanatory. 
It is only in Moshe Vosech and the worlds of Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya, our dwelling places, the lower worlds, where the revelation is in a state of descent and lowliness, right? The revel whatever, whatever revelation we have of godliness in the lower realms is more hidden. And its true power is not manifest. It's condensed and concealed. That the union of Chachma and Bina brought about through the recitation of Shema can exist without, without absolute self-nullification. Meaning, as these spheres exist in Atzilas, that union would require total and absolute self-nullification. But per, if a person reached that level when they were saying Shema, so to speak, they would just disappear, I guess. You know what I mean? Like To be able to have the union of these very high spheres on the highest level of the world, of the world, would, re, would just result in a person, you know, expiring. They can't, they couldn't contain that level of revelation in a physical body. Therefore, we only contain that level of connection of Chachman Bina in a lower realm that we can contain. So we sit when we say Shema because we're actually only experiencing it in a lower realm. We're experiencing the union of Chachman Bina in a lower realm. So we our vessel doesn't expire. In Shema Nesri, by contrast, because the union involves spheres that are on a lower plane, the unity can be fully experienced, not only as a mere reflection. Um, so that what happens for, for the, the union of Zer, Ampen, and Nukva, we could experience that unity in the world on the level of Atzilos because it's a lower level. Whoops, what happened here? Okay, because it's a lower, it's a lower level. So therefore we can stand meaning sort of get ourselves into a space of Atzilos and experience the lower level of the spheres. The lower spheres is uniting, whereas the higher levels of the, the higher spheres uniting, we can only experience on a lower level. So it's sort of like, remember we said each of the worlds has full complement of 10 spheres. We can experience the lower spheres and the higher realms and the higher spheres of the lower realms. And therefore, we're standing when we say Shema which is the lower spheres of the higher realms, and we're sitting when we say Shema, which is the higher spheres of the lower realms. The higher quality of the spiritual state experience while reciting Shema and its blessings, the union of Chachman Bina, which is the source of redemption, makes possible the union of Zer Ampen and Nukva, and thus the ascent of Malchus. So the fact that there is Chachman Bina uniting, we we only see the we only see the reflection of it in the lower realms, but it's happening in the higher realms. We just can't experience it on a cognitive level because we our cognition can't reach that high, but it's happening. So the higher quality of the spiritual state experience while reciting Shema, that's this union of Chachman Bina and its blessings, the blessings of Shema, which is the union of Chachman Bina which is the source of redemption, right? It, 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 the fact that it, it, the fact that Chachman Bina unite is the source of redemption because when Chachman Bina unite, the Midas are given birth to. The last Mida is Yisoyed. That is what actually effectuates redemption. But the source of redemption is in the uniting of Chachman Bina because you can't give birth to the Midas. I mean, you can't get to Yisoyed until Chachman Bina Unite. Just you have a, can't have a child until the mother and father unite. Once the mother and father unite, then you can give birth to a child. And the next, you know, next thing can happen, right? And you can't. So the the when Chachma being unite, that's when the Midas are given birth to, which end in Yisaid, and then Yisaid can implant the energy into Malchus. Um. And that makes possible the union of Zer Anpin and Nukva. So once Zer Anpin and Nukva unite, which is Yisoyed, unites with Malchus and it gives Malchus energy, then you can also have the ascent of Malchus. You can also have that Malchus goes down into the world. The external aspect of Malchus goes down into the world. Elevates the sparks, comes back to Atzilas, which is the redemption. So the first step is the uni unification of Chachma Bina. Then there can be unification. Then there, then there are the Midas. There can be unification of the Midas and Malchus. And then Malchus has the energy to go into the lower realms and do its thing and redeem the sparks. And that's and that's 
the connection of Geula to Tzvila. For this reason, we link a Geula Yisoy to prayer Malchus. Consequently, it is even more difficult to understand why our sages ordained the recitation of the verse, May God open my lips before Shmona Esrei, which seemingly caused a separation between Geula and prayer, in which instance it became it becomes necessary to explain that the verse was ex- appended by the sages as an extension of Shmona Esrei, so it's not actually doing, it's not making a separation, because Hashem Sefa Saitesach is connected to the Amida, and therefore since it's connected to the Amida, it's not a separation between Geula and Tvila. So we have this whole like workaround or discussion. Seemingly, it would have been more appropriate to ordain the recitation of this verse before the beginning of the prayer as a whole, before the recitation of Hadu and Shama Yisrael. We wouldn't have to ask the question, wouldn't have to have that answer. We wouldn't have to be worried that we're separating Gula and Tefillah to be told that we're not actually separating Gula and Tefillah because the sages are the ones who ordained it and connected it to Shmona Esrei. And so we're fine. Just put the verse before we start davening and we would have been completely peaceful about the whole thing. Yeah, but we wouldn't have gone through all this this wonderful stuff either. That's why it's that's why it was done. Chaya. <laughs> okay, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Anyway, that's um, that's basically a review of the first section of the mimer. I could have read this a little slower. I didn't think I was going to finish in time. <laughs> so I read it kind of quickly. But are, do, are there questions? Or you want me to pull up the review again? <laughs> Can I just make a comment? Yes. So um, since last week's class, I've really um, tried to be much more mindful and to say, um, Hashem, I, I, I give, I'll give my life for you. And it really has made a difference um, to me and, and, you know, davening and how I feel about it. And, um, you wow. know, so I, I, I wanted to say that even though a lot of these concepts are really, um, you know, give you a Hasidic headache, um, that there is practicality to, to be found. Okay. Um, I think, uh, can you hear me? Everyone is frozen and I'm frozen. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. I can hear okay. You. Okay. Well, your faces are all frozen and I'm frozen on my screen. Anyway, we might, I might actually lose the zoom in a minute, um, which I can try to get back in, but thank you for sharing that, Sarah. Um, okay. anybody else want to share anything or have a question or a comment or anything? You're going to email the uh, review to us. I can email it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank I can you. Can you can you email last week's class to me? <laughs> the, the 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 recording. recording. Yes, please. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments? Just have to say, it's so nice to be here. <laughs> like I, I wish I could come every single week, but I'm happy you had it today. I wasn't sure if you were going to, because you know sometimes on the legal holidays. But, but yeah, and it like starts the day off so well, and and um the review was amazing because obviously I wasn't here for the other classes. So thank you, Chaya. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I'm glad you're able to come to. This was a good class to come. If you could only come to one, this was a good one because you sort of got a whole thing in a nugget, you know. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. I wanted to say thank you for helping us break our brains with this. Like it's really you're very patient with us. Thank you. It's 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 hard things for all of us. <laughs> don't don't feel like you're alone in this. It's uh, it's not it's not it's not simple ideas, and this is not the full depth of the ideas either. We're you know it's whatever we're getting from it, we're getting from it. And hopefully, like Sarah said, it's something that can help us practically to daven better and to daven with more concentration and it's worth it, you know, it's we've gained. Um, and these ideas, I think the more, the more these, the more we learn these ideas, the more we see the infinite nature of God and the finite nature of man and our connection 
to Hashem and our role in the world, it just gives us a boost in general in our service of Hashem in, in all in all areas and you know helps us to understand that everything that we do has repercussions in the physical world and in the spiritual world and you know in the whole process of creation. So even though sometimes these things feel very um esoteric, they they have I think they have very far reaching effects on us and on the world when we learn them. Thank you, Chaya. Yeah, okay. All right, I think, I mean, I don't know how much longer the Zoom, my health, everything is all grayed out now. And I think we only have like a couple minutes left of class. So unless- Can I ask for a suggestion? If somebody wants to brush up on um, like these um, concepts like Zayaranpin and that, um, where would you suggest that um, that we go like to maybe just crystallize the concepts a little bit better? Um, I wonder if there's like things on Chabad.org, like classes. Uh, actually, um, there's a class that I, that I, that actually that I gave that's, I don't know if it's on Chabad.org or Torah Cafe, called something like Hasidic personality test, but it's a, it's a nice like one hour or maybe 50 minute overview of the spheres and their different, um, what they each represent and what they each are like. And I'm sure there's other classes about that too. Um, and there is a, there's not, it's not, there's a book, I don't know what it's called. I, I don't remember what it's called. Something like, I don't remember what it's called. It might be by Matis Cantor. I'm not sure. It's an older book, which talks about the spheres a little bit. Um, probably Manuel Shochatz probably has stuff on that. He wrote the he wrote the notes to the English Tani in the back. There's like appendices that talk about the four worlds and the ten spheres. Um, and I think in his series, the Hasidic Dimension, I think maybe talks about that. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, those that's what comes to mind right now. I don't know if you're still hearing me or not. <laughs> 